Okay, today we're going to learn Shabbat Daf Kuf Lamid Tet. Today's shir is dedicated by Mark Goldstein in honor of Rina Septi Goldstein, his wife of 38 years, and his Daf Yomi Chavruta. Um, we're now going to start, we ended with this very interesting topic of a machloket between Rav and then based on the Tosefta about that there will come a day when Torah will be forgotten. Versus Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who said, no way is the Torah going to be forgotten. And what really is going to be forgotten is this halacha bura or mishnah bura. First of all, the mishnah bura gets his name from here. Um, he's, which is kind of a reaction, saying, well, we lost mishnah bura then, I'm going to be mishnah bura. I'm going to show how everything is very clear cut. Um, which is really the what the mishnah bura does. It's a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, trying to say, here's the simple answer of what you need to do. Um... The what's inter- there were a few interesting things. Number one, we had the Tosefta, which said the Torah is going to be forgotten, to which the Gemara kind of narrowed down and said, wait, 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 we're not going to forget Torah. We're not going to forget things that are simply in the Mishnah, right? It's only going to be some very complicated question that people aren't going to know the answer to. And then again, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wanted to say there's no way the Torah is going to be forgotten. What's interesting about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is that he basically says that in the wake of the destruction, right, what was one of the biggest losses that we no longer have a centralization of authority? And I was thinking about it after class, that we look at, you know, he's looking at that as a bad thing. And, you know, whenever something bad happens and tragedy befalls, there's two ways you can approach something. You can either say, oh, this is terrible and just sulk in your misery, or you can take it and turn it into something positive. And I think this is a good example of something that the Jewish people have turned into something positive. Again, it's got positive and negative aspects to it, but that the, the fact that one of the things that typifies us is that we have so many opinions and that there's so many different viewpoints on everything. And it's actually a beautiful thing. And the fact that people can read the same text and interpret it in all different ways, it's one of the things that makes learning Gemara so special is that there's so many different ways of reading things and understanding things and there's room really for everything. And obviously it has to be done the proper way with respect for other opinions and not saying my brand of Judaism is the only brand of Judaism. But that's one of the beautiful things, and I think we've taken something that, and you know, it's hard to imagine, by the, you know, if you think about it, and the temple's rebuilt, and we go back, are we going to have a centralization of authority, and everyone's going to have, there's going to be one way to do things, right? it's hard to imagine that we'll ever go back to that, and that would we ever want to go back to that, so anyway, it's an interesting, interesting to think about. In light of that, I think, and connected with this idea, the next sugya starts off, Tanya, we quote a Braita, first line, on, the second line on Kuflamid Tet. Rabbi Yossi ben Elisha Omer, Im ra'ita dor shetzarot rabot ba'ot alad. If you see a generation that has terrible calamities that befall it, right? we can think about what's going on nowadays. Tzei u'bedok b'dayane Yisrael. Where's the root of the problem? In the dayanim, in the judges, in the leaders, right? Dayanim are just a, a name for ruler, judge, um, for, um, I can't think of the word money game, for leaders, Okay, it's just another word for the leaders. The problem is with the leaders. When God brings calamity on the Jewish people, it's because of trouble with the leadership. Okay, now you can view this again in two ways. The Gemara is seeming to say it's very, you know, it's, it's basically God is punishing the people because of their corrupt leaders. But you can also view it in a very realistic manner. If the leaders are not strong, and, and this is something I think we're all struggling with today, right? There's a big debate. Of what's going on here? And are, are the problems of function also of the way the leadership is handling it, right? And that one could say, when the leaders don't handle situations in a proper manner, that causes things to get much worse. So anyway, there's a lot of things you can think about this source. So basically, they now quote a pasuk from um, Micha. Shimuna zot rashe beit Yaakov uktsine beit Yisrael. God says, "Listen up." Or the Navi says, "Right, listen up." The heads of Yaakov and the 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 ktsinim, the officers of Yisrael, hamitavim mishpat, they pervert justice. Ve'et kol ha'yishara yakshu, and everything straight, they they turn not straight, crooked. Bonet ziyom b'damim, they're building Jerusalem with. Blood, be Yerushalayim ba'avla, and Yerushalayim with injustice. Rasheha b'shochad yishpotu. And here come their three sins that we're going to refer to in another minute. They're, the heads of their country are, or of their nation, are taking bribes, 
are judging people through bribery. V'ko'aneh, and the Kohanim, we're going to have the leaders, which are the judges. We have the Kohanim, who are the priests. B'mechir yoru, they will teach, in those days the Kohanim were the teachers. They will teach with money. Basically, if somebody pays them, then they'll say what that person wants them to say. Univiyah b'kesef yiksomu. And the Nivi'im, well, the prophets, will prophesy based on who pays them money. Now, here's the interesting part. Va'al Hashem Yish'anu. It's not that they don't believe in God. They'll, they rely on God. But how do they rely on God? They say, They're evil people, but they say, Hashem Yishmol, right? We always hear this term, right? God will save us. In other words, I can do whatever I want because I have God behind me. This is obviously a perverted way of understanding things. Right? God will be behind you if you go in the right way. But they say, oh, I can do whatever I want because I have God on my side. God will protect me, okay? And that is the way that they kind of clear their conscience and saying, well, because I have God, I can do whatever I want. Lefichach, because of that, So God will bring three punishments based on the three sins that they did. Right? Remember, the Kohanim, the judges, and the, and the prophets all did, each did something. Three sins, now three punishments. Shenema. Lachem biglachem, because... Of you, the pasuk continues. What will happen? Zion Zion will be a plowed field, basically completely destroyed. Yim will be heaps. Okay, nothing basically. And the harabayat will be like a like a forest. And God will only rest His presence, meaning. After the destruction, again, very apropos that this is happening during the nine days leading up to the destruction. So he says, what will, what is the way to basically bring the presence of God back when you get rid of bad leaders? Okay, bad judges, bad, bad policemen. First of all, the last Four words should sound familiar. It's where we the our tefillah comes from in Shmona Esrei. We say Hashiva Shovtenu Kevarishona Vyotzenu Kevatchila. That's taken from this verse, from this verse in Yeshayahu. There's a very famous pasuk in Yeshayahu, Perak Aleph, the first chapter, where basically God says, "I'm going to etzrof kabor sigaich." The sigaich, it's a it's a, a metaphor. The sigim are the bad parts of the silver. Okay, it's the um, God is going to basically, at Tzorof, is to purify. He's going to purify like bor. Bor is like borit. It's with lye. It's cleaning material. So I will clean out the sigim, va'asira kol b'dilaych, and I will take out all of the lead that's in mixed in with the silver. In other words, again, all the bad stuff, I will clean out. Right? It's like taking out the bad from the good. It's kind of like borer. Va'ashiva shoftah k'vishonah v'yotzah k'vatkalah. And after all that's done and all the bad is wiped out and it's all clean and pure, then I can bring back the shoftim and the yotzim, the, the advisors, like in the beginning. That's the only way to do it. Amr Ula, en Yerushalayim nifteh ala b'tzdaka. This is the next verse in Yeshayahu. Jerusalem is only redeemed with righteousness. Shanemar tziyom b'mishpat tifpadeh v'shavah b'tzdaka. Okay, it will be... It will be redeemed through righteousness um, and good judgment. Amara Papa. Okay, he's going to explain this pasuk in a little bit of a different way. Asiva etzrof kabur sigaich v'asira kol b'dilaich. He views as two stages. First one and then the second one. So how does he explain? Ibat le'yehire, bat le'am goshe. Ibat le'dayane, bat le'gazir pete. If you get rid of the Yehirim, the Yehirim are the arrogant leaders. If you get rid of the arrogant leaders, then we'll be able to get rid of the Persian the magicians. There were these magicians or prophets of the Persians that were causing problems. First, you have to get rid of, again, it's the same thing. First, you have to get rid of your own in order. This is, again, I think it's a. It's more not that because you did that, God will help you with that. It's It's got two levels. Number one, God will help you. Number two, Again, if you get rid of corrupt leadership, you'll be able to fight against your enemies properly. If you don't have good leaders, then it's very hard to fight against your enemies. And if you get rid of the bad Dianim, the bad judge, judges, then you'll get rid of the Gezir Tepeh, who are the Roman officers. So how does this work from the Pasuk? Which means, if you get rid of the Sigim, now here they do a play on words. Sigim is with the Samach. 
But it's like Sigim from Niskavim, Segev in, with Sin Gimel Bet. That root means to be high, high above. So the ones who are arrogant, who are high, if you get rid of those and you get rid of the Kibor Sigai, then you'll get rid of the um, Goshim. There, Asira Kol Bedilaich. Then God will kick in and he will get rid of the Bedilim, those are, who are separated from you, those are the Persians. Okay, that's how they understand the Pasuk. Um, and he bat le dayane, bat le kazir pate, dirtiv, he sir Hashem mishpatecha, pana oivecha. Here's a verse that says, Hashem, right, if you get rid of, he sir Hashem mishpatecha, your bad judges, then pana oivecha, then your enemies will go away. Amar rabbi melay mishum rabbi lazar rabbi shima. My dirtiv, shavar Hashem mater shaim, shevet moshlim. What is this? Mate Rishaim, the staff of your of the bad people, and the staff of the the rod of the rulers. So Shavar Hashem Mate Rishaim, Elo Hadayanim. This is a reference to Dayanim, the the Mate Rishaim, the staff of the wicked, is the judges. Why are they called Mate Dayanim? Uh, Mate Rishaim, Shanasu Makel Lechazanehem. There's a few different interpretations. Rashi seems to say that what happens, their Chazanim, the advisors, basically rule them. Okay, they give their, their staff to them. Okay, they say basically whatever the Chazanim tell them to do, this is what they do. They don't really think for themselves and they're just ruled by their underlings. Shevet Moshlim, what is that? Those are the rod of the rulers. Elu Tamidei Chachamim. The rulers are the Tamidei Chachamim and it's Shebe Mishpachot Dayani. These are rulers, um, these are, sorry, these are Tamidei um, Chachamim. Wise men who, what? They're family members of the judges. And what happens? They protect the evil judges because they're their family members. So even though they're really bad, they kind of protect them and say, oh no, what they're doing is right. And, and they make them look good. And that's, you know, again, that's describing a corrupt system. Marzut Ramar, he has a different interpretation. Elu Tamidei Chachamim, he thinks they're Tamidei Chachamim, but not ones that are in the family of the of the Dayanim. But Shemelamdim Hilchot Sibor LeDayanei Bor. What do they do? Now, this some people say that they. There's two different ways of understanding this. Either the Tamidei Chachamim are part of the problem, or they don't realize that what they're doing is causing problems. So either. Let's say they're part of the problem. They're teaching the Dayane Bor. What's a Dayan Bor? It's, the, it's like an oxymoron. It's a Dayan who doesn't know anything, right? Generally, we think Dayanim are people who are knowledgeable. It's someone who doesn't know anything. But they teach some basic, Hilchotzibor, some basic public things to the judges. And then it makes the judges look like they know what they're talking about. And then they really don't, but they look like they do in the, in the public eye. And the Tamidei Chachamim are at fault because they're teaching these things to the judges so that they can look like they know what they're doing. Some people say that they, they do it, they don't realize. They start teaching them, hoping that they're going to judge properly, and that when they have questions, they'll come back to the Tamidei Chachamim. But they don't realize that the Dayanim are going to just take the little bit that they know and make out of it as if they know a lot, and they're not going to really go back to the Tamidei Chachamim. So in one, the Tamidei Chachamim are... are complicit in what's going on. In the other, it's their fault, but they don't really realize it's their fault. Okay, now this is going to be a bit of a lead-in to the upcoming sugya where we're going to see that if you're in a position of knowledge, you have to be careful when you tell other people what to do, they might come to misuse your information that you're giving them. So that theme is going to come up in a bit. I'm a Rabbi Lazar ben Malai, Mishum Rish Lakish. My dichtiv ki kapechem ni goalu badam. Okay, what is the meaning of this pasuk? We're going to have four sections. Your hands are full of blood, or dirtied with blood, or soiled with blood. Ve'etz ba'otechem ba'avon, and your fingers with iniquity. Siftotechem dibru sheker, your mouths, your lips will speak lies. Lishonchem avla, and your tongues, um, wicked things. Avla uh, te'ege, will speak, un, you know, uh, inappropriate things. So, ki kapachem nigoalu badam, what's that? Elo hadayanim. These are the dayanim. Why? What do they use their hands for? To take bribes. Ve'etz bo'teichem ba'avon, who uses their fingers? Elu sofrei hadayanim. These are the sofrim. They're the ones who are the scribes, who write down the words of, you know, the, the evil judgments. Siftotechem dibru sheker. Elu orchei hadayanim. These are the, the lawyers. Lishonchem avla te'ege elu ba'alei dinim. They're basically saying... Everybody who's part of the judgment system is, is corrupt. 
the people who come, will they get bribes? The, the lawyers try to, you know, twist the judgment. The, the judges rule and the Sofrim write it all down. That's Rabbi Yitzchak from Migdal. Okay, now it seems like we're getting off on some tangent, although I think I can connect them pretty easily when we finish. I'll show you. From the day that Yosef left his brothers, he didn't drink wine at all. How do we know this? It says, Okay, on his head, he was a Nazir to his brothers, meaning he was separate from his brothers. That's what the Pshad is. Nazir means to, to put yourself to the side, but Nazir also means a Nazir, someone who doesn't drink wine. So they say from there we learn he himself was a Nazir and he didn't drink any wine. Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Chanin Amar, Afhem Lota Mutam Yain. They also didn't drink any wine. It wasn't just, it wasn't like Yosef was any more special. The brothers also didn't drink wine. How do we know that? It says the second time the brothers come to Egypt, it says before the whole thing happens with Binyamin and they put the, the cup in Binyamin's bag the goblet. So it says they sat and they got drunk with him. So what do you see? It sounds like they weren't drinking until then. It was like, a, oh, they hadn't drunk in so long. But Idach, the first opinion, Rabbi Malai, says, Shichrutu de lo hava shata, shatya, uh, sorry, Shichrutu de lo hava shatya mi hava. It says they sat and drank and got drunk with him. What they hadn't done in a long time was get drunk. But they had drunk wine in the meantime. So basically, one opinion says it was only Yosef, and the other one says actually all the brothers didn't drink wine all that time. Another leader who is unique is Aharon. When it says that Moshe, when God tells Moshe, go to, in the beginning, when he says you're going to be the leader and you're going to tell Paro, etc. You're going to be the, the, the you know, and, and what does he say? Aaron's going to go with you. And he says, when you go back home, you'll see Aaron and he's going to be happy for you. And what does that mean? He's going to be happy for you. Normally, what would you expect? He'd be jealous. Why wasn't I chosen? I was the older brother. So instead of being jealous, and we saw that all throughout Bereshit, right? But instead he was happy for him. And because of that, he got the Chosha Mishpat on his heart, right? It's a good sign if in your heart, you're not jealous. Therefore, he gets rewarded that he gets to have the Chosha Mishpat on, that sits on the Kohen Gadol's heart. Okay, so what, what's the connection of Yosef and Aaron? Obviously, they're trying to foil everything we said until now with, and these are examples of good leaders, right? Ones who don't drink wine, ones who don't have jealousy in their hearts. Right? These are the proper attributes of the true leader. Okay. Another reason it could be here, by the way, was just because we were quoting statements by Rabbi Milai, so they quoted other things that Rabbi Milai said. Right? He's not the most common, he doesn't speak up a lot in the Gemara, you don't hear him very often. I don't even know, I don't remember where else he comes up, but um, he's definitely not one of the most common people, so maybe once they were bringing up statements of his, they brought up others, but again, this is clearly connected. Okay. Now we're going to have, like I said, we're going to get back to this issue. We're moving on to another topic, although it's connected with the previous, which was about the kila, building this canopy bed. Um, putting the sheet up on top. So it's connected in that way, but it's also connected to the idea of people, when people teach halachot, they have to be careful what they do because of how it might be interpreted, misinterpreted, or what it might lead to, as we call the slippery slope. Okay, and actually the Gefet this week, or Yael Shimoni, if your Hebrew is good, she gave a whole shiur that's on our site about um about this slippery slope argument, and specifically as it relates to teaching your children, okay? Because we're going to see within this, there's a sugi about teaching your children and thinking that they might come to misinterpret something or letting your children do something that's not allowed. And when they get older, they might think that it's allowed. So you have to be very careful about this, and, and she goes into the Tosfot on that. Okay, so let's start. It's a very interesting topic. So the sons of Bashkar, meaning the city, Bashkar, which seems like it was a city where there weren't teachers, and that's why there weren't rabbis around. That's why they sent their question to somebody else. And because of that, when you're living in a city where there's no rabbis, generally they're not so careful about Torah. They don't know a lot, and there's more reason for concern. So they asked they weren't bad people. They wanted to know the halacha. So they asked Levi the following three questions. Okay, so they asked three questions. Kila mahu. Kishuta bakarma mahu. Make biyom tov mahu. Number one, kila. Can you build a canopy on Shabbat? Number two, if you have hops and you want to plant them in a vineyard, is that a problem of kila? Mixing two things. You can't mix seeds in the ground with 
can't mix like um, vegetables with a vineyard, but you actually, it's not forbidden me to all right to, to do a tree. So the question is, are hops considered more like a tree or more like, um, like something you plant in the ground? Mate be Yom Tov Mahu. What if someone dies on Yom Tov? Are you allowed to deal with the burial? So Ada Azil, now they sent this question to Levi in the meantime, until the question got there, Nach Nafshe de Levi, he died. Okay, right, obviously in those days it took longer for questions to get to places. And in the meantime, he was no longer alive. Um, so now what happened? Amr Shmuel Rav Menashe, Shmuel says to Rav Menashe, I chakimat shalach lehu. If you're smart and you know the answers to these questions, you take care of it. Okay, maybe Shmuel didn't have the time to deal with it on his own, so he gave it to Rav Menashe. I'm not sure exactly why. And I'm not sure why the Gemara is telling us this whole story, right? You might have just said, well, they sent this question and they got this answer, but they seem important, seem like it's important for us to know. The person who they sent the question to died. And maybe also it's important some people ask a particular rabbi and they want that rabbi to answer them. So maybe that's why Shmuel didn't want to answer himself. Maybe he disagreed with Levi on certain things and maybe that's why he picked Rav Menashe. I didn't check. It would be interesting to check. Maybe Rav Menashe was a student of Levi. Um, if someone wants to look that up. Anyway, um, he says, listen, if you know the answers, answer them. So Shalach Lehu, he answers them. So we're going to go one by one. Kila. He says to them, I looked all around, tried to find any kind of way out, couldn't find a way to say it's okay. Sorry, you can't do it. So now he gets asked, they say, I assume Shmuel asks him, why don't you send them Kidder Rami Bar Yecheskel? Remember what Rami Bar Yecheskel said yesterday? He said that, not yesterday in the story, yesterday in yesterday's stuff, he said that if it has these threads or ropes attached to it, then it's okay to spread it out because then you're just kind of spreading it out already, right? And it has the strings already on it. It's much simpler to do. So why don't you tell them to do it like that? Or some people say it already had a tefach, right? And it was just mosif ohel. That's okay. So why don't you tell them that way? He answers, lefisha enam b'nei Torah. Okay, and this is what he's going to answer to all three questions. After he answers them, no, 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 he's going to be asked, why didn't you say yes? There was reason to say yes. And he says, listen, I was worried because they're not B'nai Torah. They might, right? What happens? If I say it's allowed that way, they'll do it even without the strings. And then they're going to end up doing something wrong. So basically, in order to prevent them from doing sins, he was just more stringent. Kishuta Bikarma. What about hops and a karim? Irbuva. He says, that's mixing, mixed breeds. You can't do that. The Lishlach Luka to Rabbi Tarfon. Why don't you send them like Rabbi Tarfon? He gets asked. Why don't you say, Detanya Kishut Rabbi Tarfon Omer Ein Kilaim Bekerem. The Chachamim Omer Kilaim Bekerem. Rabbi Tarfon viewed Kishut as a tree and said there's no Kilaim problem. And Chachamim said there is. Now, why would you want to pass on like Rabbi Tarfon against the rabbis? Well, here comes the important line. The Kaimalan, and it's known to us, the Kolamekel Ba'aretz, Halachak Moto Bechutz Ba'aretz. When you have things that are dependent on the land, which means they're mitzvot ha-tuliot ba'aretz, they're things that are specifically for Eretz Yisrael. So if there's a machloket about them in Eretz Yisrael, when we move to Chutz La'aretz, and the city of Bashkar was in Chutz La'aretz, when we get to Chutz La'aretz, since they weren't endemic, they're not particularly for that land, even though those laws still apply, we basically say we can go by the more lenient opinion. So in this case, everyone would agree. We can hold like Rabbi Tarifon in Chutz La'aretz and say it's okay. So again, he answers the fisha in Am Torah. Since they're not B'nai Torah, I didn't want to tell them because I was worried that they would make mistakes based on that. Right? They might think if you can put this in the ground, then you can put other things in the ground and plant it in, in the vineyard. Machriz, now we're going to see a bunch of ways that people dealt with this issue. If they wanted to plant the hops, how did they do it? We're now a bit on a tangent. Machriz Rav, he basically announced, Hi, man, Dubai, le Mizra, Kashuta, Bakarma, Lizra. He said, we don't hold like Rabbi Tarifon. Anyone could do it, or, or I'm sorry, we hold like Rabbi Tarifon, basically. In Chutz Laaretz, basically what we just said, he taught everyone you can do this, okay? Against what Rabbi Menashe said, of course, Rabbi Menashe was only saying it for those who were not B'nai Torah, but he basically announced one can do this. Rabbi Amram Chasida Mangid Ilave. He actually said anyone who does this is put into excommunication. He took it very seriously in the other direction and said, no way, no how. Now we're going to see some people and how they did this. Rav Mesharshi Yavle Pruta Latinok. He gave a pruta to a tinok. Okay, he, this is not Rav Menashe, it's Rav Mesharshi, it's someone else. He would pay a tinok nochri. He paid a non-Jewish child, not a baby. It says baby literally, but it means a non-Jewish child. Vizarale, 
Okay, he paid a non-Jewish young kid to do it for him. That way it's allowed, okay? In other words, theoretically it's allowed, so let's do it in this way. And that way I'm showing that I don't think it's fully allowed, right? So the people understand that there's a distinction between this and planting other things. So now, here comes the question, and this is really where the Tosfo comes in that Yael Shimoni deals with in her Shi'or, which is, Why don't you give it to a young Jewish kid? Because young Jewish kid is not chayab b'mitzvot. And this is a classic issue, right? Let's say it's Shabbat, and you forgot to turn on the light. Are you allowed to ask a kid to turn on the light on Shabbat? And the answer is no. Why no? Even though he's little, he might not understand. There's this concern, Ate le Misrach. He might remember that when he was a kid, he turned on the light on Shabbat, and he'll think it's okay to turn on the light on a, you know, when I get older. Ate le Misrach is something that comes up in a bunch of places, and Tosfo lists a few of the cases where it comes up and tries to make a rule out of it, because basically it seems like sometimes we're worried about this and sometimes we're not worried about it, and the question is, where are the distinctions? Like the Rashba, for example, says, a very interesting one, he says, the issue here is that you can't tell a kid to do it. But if a kid does it himself, it's okay. Because the kid doing something himself, he knows, well, I know I can't do this when I get older, I can do it now. Whereas if a grown-up says, please do this, then they don't, under, right, they might think, oh, if the grown-up's telling me to do it, well, then it's allowed. That's one possible. Um, Tosfo makes some distinctions and he brings up this issue of at a Brit Milan Yom Kippur, you can give a kid the wine to drink. Okay, but let's say when you want to make Shechianu on Yom Kippur, and usually we make it over a cup of wine, we can't have a kid drink. Okay, I think that's the case where he's talking about on Yom Kippur regularly, you can't. And he talks about the one possible distinction is something that happens very often, like on a year-to-year -year basis, we don't, the kid will remember, every Yom Kippur, this is what I do. But if it happens on a one-off, how often do you have a Brit Milan on Yom Kippur? That's so rare that we're not worried that they're going to get confused and do it when they get older. So it's a very interesting thing in terms of thinking about in which cases are we worried they're going to get confused, and in which cases are we not concerned. The litain le le gadol nochri. Okay, so now we have to explain. We understand when you don't give it to a Jewish kid, but why did you give it to a young non-Jew? Why don't you just give it to an older non-Jew? Right, non-Jew could do it. So what's the difference? So ati lechlufe be Israel. Once you tell a non-Jew, this is very interesting, right? It seems like not everybody knew who was Jewish, who wasn't Jewish. So if you told someone to do it for you and you have this worker in your field, right? Like maybe think about now, there's all these farm workers who work in, in agriculture in this country. So, you know, theoretically you would say, oh, you give it to a farm worker, but you might confuse the farm worker with a Jew, right? Obviously certain farm workers you might not necessarily confuse with a Jew, but certain ones, you know, and in those days, the non-Jews living among them were of the same culture as them theoretically, and they might've been confused and think that you could tell a Jew to do it. Okay, getting to the third topic now, mate. Shalach lehu, mate lo yitaskube lo yudaan velo hamiyan. Okay, so a mate, no one can do it, not a Jew, not a non-Jew, he tells them. Lo biyom tov rishon velo biyom tov sheni. Not on the first day of Chag and not even on the second day of Chag. Now again, the second day of Chag is, um, is also, um, is second day of Yom Tov in Chutz Laaretz, which is, Maybe it's Yom Tov, maybe it's not. So even then you can't do it. Okay, before I go, I see um, someone wrote in the chat, which is, is a good point to bring up. Thank you for reminding me. That's what we do. It's specifically what we do this, right? The Havdalah case is what we do this year, uh, sorry, this week in Havdalah. On the nine days, you're not allowed to drink the wine for Havdalah. So here we allow the kid to drink the wine, okay? And we have him or the grape juice. Okay, because we're not allowed to drink because of the nine days. So it's interesting. There, we're not worried. Now, again, you have to, it's, it's another question about which issues, right? That's a minhag not to drink wine on, on Tishba. It's not like a halacha from the Torah, right? So there's in terms of when we worry that they might come to confuse and when not also depends on how severe the, what they might come to mistaken is. Okay, so that's another interesting, thanks for bringing that up, Becky. Okay, moving on. So now we said he basically tells them no can do, not on Yom Tov Rishon, not on Yom Tov Shani, not by non-Jews, can't do it, can't bury. They have to remember. And nowadays, it's not such a big deal. I mean, it's unfortunate for the family to have to wait a long time, but at least we have a place where we can preserve the body in a, in a place where it's protected. In those days, they didn't have places to protect bodies. So the body would really start to rot. And it was really a big issue. So they start questioning, Eni, is this really true? 
uh, and a, a thing happened. If you remember, we had it the other day when the baby died. They said uvda, that like a thing happened, almost like they didn't want to say that somebody died. But basically, it means somebody died. Samuch le Shabbat. It was it was close to Shabbat. Velo yadana, meaning it was Yom Tov. That was next to Shabbat. Velo yadana ima lefana ima lachare. Not clear whether it happened on Friday or it happened on Sunday. Either which way, it happened on Yom Tov. That was next to Shabbat. So you're ending up with two days or maybe even three days. Oh, this must have happened in Israel. So it obviously wasn't in, uh, it was in two days of Chag. But, He said, let non-Jews do the burial. So why are you telling them they can't do the burial when Rabbi Yochanan allowed it? And also Rava said, Maybe Yom Tov Rishon Yit Asku Bo Amim. Rava gives a whole, whole detailed thing. If the if the person dies on on the first day of Yom Tov, then you have to have non Jews can deal with the burial. Be Yom Tov Sheni Yit Asku Bo Yisrael. If it happens on the second day of Chag, then Jews can deal with it. Ba'afilu Be Yom Tov Sheni Shalosh Hashana Ma Sheinkin Bebeitza. And even if it comes out on the second day of Yom Tov Mechutz Laaretz, um, of, sorry, the second day of Rosh Hashana. Which generally, okay, what's the big issue? This is what all the Masechah Beitzah, or at least the beginning of Masechah Beitzah starts off with. The Masechah Beitzah is all about Yom Tov. Why? Because it's all about a Beitzah that was, that, was, that was hatched on the first day of Yantif. Can you eat it on the second day? Because you could say, if it was born on the first day and the first day was in a, if it was, the first day was Yom Tov, then today is already a regular day and of course you can eat it. And if it was born, right, because it has to be Muhan, remember it has to be from before. And this was born on Yom Tov. Other, and if, the second day is really Chag. Well, then it was born on the first day, and the first day wasn't even Chag. It was Chol. Right? Remember, we have two days because we're not sure which day is actually the holiday because of the whole issue with, in Israel, they determine when the new moon was, but people in outside of Israel didn't get the news so quickly, and therefore they never knew which day it really was. So now, he basically says the two days of Rosh Hashanah are different. They're a whole different thing, and we'll get to that when we get to it later. But the whole Rosh Hashanah is considered what we call Yom Arichta, one long day. And it's not Suffolk one day, Suffolk the other day. Okay, and that's because even in the Beit HaMikdash, they didn't know whether it was going to be two days or not because they had to wait till the witnesses came. And witnesses theoretically come by the, by the time they got there in time. It could be a very long time. So basically, we have to... Uh, we have to... Right, sorry, I said hatched. I meant laid the egg, not hatched. Um, if the egg was laid... Thank you for the correction. Um, so anyway, we now have that the two days of Rosh Hashanah, when it comes to burial, are treated like the two days of Yom Tov in Galuyot for the purposes of burial, meaning a Jew can bury on the second day of Yom Tov. Okay, so now what do you see? They made all these dispensations. You know, either you could do non-Jews on the first day, you could do Jews on the second day. So why do you say, no, they can't do it? And obviously, his answer is going to be Lafisha Enam B'nai Torah. We're worried about them because they're not B'nai Torah. So, because of that, we're basically going to say, right, he was very stringent for these people because he was worried about if I allow them to do this, then they'll do more. Okay, and this is classic. We all know this to be the case that that's what happens, right? People see, oh, if you can do this, well, then I'll do less. I'm a Rabbi Avin Baruch. And then the question is, how far do, do we have to go like he did? Or, you know, and then obviously, it's very specific about what things were worried people will misconstrue. And, and obviously, again, it depends how severe it is. Like with this drinking wine on for Havdalah during the nine days, we're maybe not as worried. And there, right, there's two things here. One is about teaching your children. And one is about teaching to a congregation of people who are not necessarily strong in Torah or don't have rabbis to kind of keep them in check you know, or, or knowledgeable people living around them who could correct them if they go off to the wrong direction. Amar Rabbi Avin Bar Rav Huna, Amar Rav Chama Bar Guria. Now we're going to go back to this issue about the kila. Okay, I just want to remind you how we got off on these big tangents. The first tangent was all about um, Rav, Rami Bar Yechezkel, asked Rav Huna, teach me three things that Rav said, two about Shabbat, one about Torah. The first one was about the kila. Right, And then he taught him two things about Shabbat and then the one about Torah, which is about the Torah being forgotten. From there, we got off on this long tangent about the leaders. And then when we finished that, we got, which also, again, like I told you, that sugi connects with leaders because it's all about leaders knowing how to lead properly. When you have to tell people yes and when you have to tell people no. Right, When you're asked a halachic question, there's not always a clear yes and no answer. And the 
the person asks can depend can adjust it based on the situation, which is always a problem when you take a shelo to chuvot and you want to learn halacha from it, right? Because to shelo to chuvot are written for particular situations in general. Um, anyway, the next sugya became because we were talking about the kila again. One of the questions again, there were three questions asked. It was like the same structure. He asked, I want to hear three things from Rav. Also, these people asked three questions. And again, one was about the kila, and that's how we got to it, this canopy. And then we got off on the other three, you know, the other two. Now we're back to our issue about kila. So, um, but I lost my place. Okay, we're now at Amarabi Avin Baravuna. We're at the two dots, six lines from the top. Um, he said the name of Hamar Baguria, Mitatef Adam Bekila Ubekaskasev Yotzele Rashut Rabin Bishabat. You could take this kila. Now here we're not we're talking about the, the the cloth that they use for the canopy. You can wrap it around yourself kind of like a shawl or a or a cloak with its straps. Okay, even if it has its straps attached, and you can go out into the public domain, and we're not worried that you're carrying straps. The straps are really unnecessary. So theoretically, they're not serving any purpose. Theoretically, you're carrying something on Shabbat that you're not allowed to carry. So how could this be? So So why does he allow this? Why is it any different from what Rav Huna said? Rav Huna said in the name of Rav. If you walk around with tzitzit, let's say you started tying the knots on your tzitzit, and you ended up on three corners, you have tzitzit, the strings, but you don't have on the fourth. This is now tzitzit shalok kil chata. It's a baguette, so you could wear the baguette, but what's the problem? The, clo- the, the clothing that you're wearing, so it's clothing, that's fine, but it has these strings hanging down that are totally useless because they're not useful for tzitzit, and they're not useful for your clothes because they're not, it's not like it's attractive to have strings hanging out of your clothes. So therefore... They're unnecessary, and you can't walk out with this baguette on Shabbat because you're carrying unnecessary strings. So it seems to be the exact same thing. So well, there you're carrying unnecessary strings, and we allow it. So what does he answer? When it comes to the tzitzit on the talit, or on the, the, clo- the four-corner garment you're wearing, talit is just a word for four-corner garment here, you see the word talit in the Gemara doesn't really mean always talit that we say. That is not... Sig- th- those are very significant because they're there for the mitzvah. So you can't just say, oh, we can ignore them. They're canceled out to the, to the cloth. But when it comes to this cloth with the strings attached, the strings are very insignificant. And we just say, oh, they're neutralized, basically. Compared to the cloth, they're not significant. And therefore, there is if they're not there. Amar Rabba Ma'arim adam ala mishmeret b'yom tov litlot barimonim. We're now back. How did we get to this whole thing about the kila? Because we were talking about Oal Arai and building temporary tents, and that all came from building this mishmeret, this, um, this uh, what's it called, the strainer, the wine strainer. So now we're going to talk about Ha'arama. Okay, this is going to be actually the opposite. We're going to eventually get to something which is the exact opposite of the slippery slope we're going to see this is the opposite, right? There he wanted to tell everyone, be machmir, because we're worried what you might come to do if we allow you things. Here we're going to say more is allowed. Why? What's the case? So you can be do a little trickery here. What do you do? You basically say, listen, I'm hanging this not to be a wine strainer. A wine strainer can function for all sorts of things. It's basically like a basket type thing. So you can hang pomegranates in it, not to strain them, just to hang pomegranates in it. So he says, if you want, you could, on Yom Tov, Remember, Chachamim said on Yom Tov, you can't hang it. But what can you do? You can strain if it's already hung. So what does he say? You can basically hang it in order to cap, to hold your rimonim, your pomegranates, and then change your mind and say, oh, I want to put my wine in it. Now you can strain it because it's already been put up in a way that's allowed, even though you actually put it up on Yom Tov. So I'm a Ravashi. Ravashi says, wait, under one condition. You have to first put the rimonim in. You can't start straining your wine until you put the rimonim in. Because you can't just say, I want to do it for rimonim and then use it for wine. People are going to see and think that you really just built it for wine. And then it's a maridayim problem. So therefore, you have to actually hang your rimonim. So now the Gemara asks, wait a minute. My shname had detanya. But there's another case where we allow something we don't make you do what you intended it for. Or we'll see. It's a little bit different. But we don't make you make it clear what you're using it for. So my shame had Tanya mitilim shechar b'moed l'tzorach hamoed. You could start brewing beer on chalamoed. Chalamoed is a day where right, the intermediate days of the holiday where you're not really supposed to work. You can work if it's a financial loss. You can work right. There's all different ways you could do things, but you're not supposed to do unnecessary things. So 
you can actually start brewing your beer on Cholomoed, Litzorah Chamoed. Okay, you can do it for, if you want to brew your beer, for the holiday, it's okay. Shalom Litzorah Chamoed, but if you want it for after the holiday, Asur. Echad Shechar Tmarim, Echad Shechar Sorim, whether it's date beer or barley beer. Afal Pisha Yesh Lehem Yashan, but even if you have old beer in your house, that meaning you don't really need it for Chag, Ma'arim Veshotem in Achadash, you can basically say, well, I want new beer. I don't want to drink my old beer. I want to drink my new beer. So you can basically start brewing this beer, even though you have enough beer for Chag. Okay? You just say, I want new beer. So there, what do you see? Even though you have old ones at home, when you're brewing it, you don't have to show anyone that, oh, I'm getting rid of my old beer. and I'm, I ha-, right? You don't have to make some sort of indicator that you're doing it because you want it on, that, on the holiday. So therefore, it seems like, it's not exact comparison, but it seems like you don't have to make, you don't have to actually, um, you know, get rid of your old beer, let's say from your house or something, or make some indication that you don't have any old beer. So they say, that's because these are two different things. Hatam lo chamilta. Ha There, it's not clear. Nobody knows whether you have beer stored up in your house or not. Nobody's going into your storage house to see do you have beer. So it's not noticeable. But if you take this mishmerit and you hang up the strainer and you put wine in it, it's pretty clear you did it for wine. There it's going to be obvious. So therefore, you have to do the rimonium first. So they go to Ravashi and they say, listen, we saw this guy. He's a Tamich Chacham. They confused a little bit of his name, but he basically did the following and it's very upsetting that he did this. What did he do? He took a slice of garlic and he stuck it to seal up a hole that he had in this opening where the spout was of the barrel, he stuck it in the spout to basically close it up, which is a problem of, it looks like he's mitakin kli. It only looks like because nobody really fixes a utensil with food. They're obviously going to take it out and it's temporary, but still it looks like he's fixing a, a utensil, which is forbidden. And the Amr, and then another thing he did um, the Amr, oh, sorry. What did he say? He said, oh, I'm putting this here because I want to keep it for later. So I don't want anyone to eat it. I'm sticking it there so nobody will take it. Right? It's a good tactic if you're in my house. There's always people have things that they make or that they want to eat that they don't want anyone else eating, right? So you have to stick it away somewhere. The Azel Benayim B'mavra. Another thing he did, he went into the ferry boat and he, and he went to sleep. The Amr and the owner of the ferry boat came, took it, the ferry to the other side of the river. The Seer Perry, he went and checked his fruits that are on the other side of the river. The Amr, and he just said, oh, Anna Lamenam Kamachavne. Oh, I was just going to sleep here, right? I needed a nice place to sleep. Happened to be, I took the ferry, you know, I went into the ferry. Oh, he took me to the other side. Oh, now I can get out and look at my fruits. So he obviously used what we call Harami here, and it seems a little weird. The rabbis weren't so happy with this. So Amr Lehi, Amr Lehu, Ravashi says to them, Harama Kamra, to what? You're worried about Harama? Is that what you're concerned, that he used trickery here? Harama de Rabbanani. These both are on Rabbanan issues. We're not worried. In that if it was a dough right to issue, it would be a problem. But both the things that he did were only Rabbanans. And he is a Tamil Chacham. When it comes to a Tamil Chacham, it's the exact opposite of the She'enam B'nei Torah. What's nice here is the Sugyot theoretically aren't really supposed to connect, but they all connect. Right? It's saying when it comes to Tamil Chacham, we're not worried he's going to think that it's okay otherwise. And we're not worried that he's going to accidentally do what the whole concern is. So Harama is allowed for Tamil Chacham, where it's not necessarily allowed for other people. And this, by the way, if you want to really connect it, once we have special dispensations for Tamil Chachamim, you can see why they might become arrogant and it would cause problems with the leadership. So there's a bit of a cyclical thing going on here um, between all the sugyas. Okay, continuing. Mishnah. This is a case of, we all know there's what's called a Brita water filter. Can you use that on Shabbat, right? Where you pour theoretically clean water, but you put it in a filter because it's not clean enough. You want it to be even more clean or using any kind of water filter on Shabbat. This is allowed because you could drink the water otherwise. So therefore, you're not really taking out anything. It's already clear. The wine has already been been, uh, strained. So you can take wine that's already been strained and you can do it in sudarim, like on a cloth. Okay, not in the mis- uh, not in the mishmeret on Shabbat, because we just said you could do the previous mishnah. But you could do it on a cloth in a bit of a different way. And kfifa mitzrit in a basket, this Egyptian basket that was made out of um, um, palm fronds. 
Vinotnim Beit Saba Masenet Shachardal. We learned this already about the egg. We'll talk about it more tomorrow. You could put it in the um, the mustard strainer. Vosin Omalim B'Shabbat. Uh, anomlin. It was a mix. Uh, they would mix wine, some sort of drink they made with wine. You can prepare it on Shabbat. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, B'Shabbat Bekos, B'Yom Tov B'Lagin, U'B'Mo'eh B'Chavit. Each day has a different amount you can use. On Shabbat, you could do only a cup's worth. On Yom Tov, you could do a lagin. I assume it's a, it measures a log, okay, which is much more than a kos. Ubi mo'ed, on chol mo'ed, you could even do it in a barrel. Rabbi Tzadik Gomer, hakol orchin. He says it all goes by your, your um, guests. Okay, what does this mean? This means, it's very interesting, it's about astringency and leniency. It means that if you have a lot of guests, then even on, um, even on, Yom to, even on Shabbat, you can do more. But if you have fewer guests on Cholom Oed, let's say, you can't do it in a big barrel. So it goes in both directions. Although some people think he's only talking about Cholom Oed and he's not even talking about Shabbat. He doesn't allow you to do more on Shabbat. There's a debate about his opinion. Amr Ze'eri. Ze'eri says, adam yayin mayim b'shabbat You can even put clear wine. Wine that's already been strained, you can put in a strainer. Or water you can put in a strainer and you don't have to worry. But not if it's sullied waters or sullied, you know, or wine with the dregs. They say, but this contradicts the following source. Okay, you can mix up the wine in a barrel it and all its dregs. And you can put it in the strainer and you don't have to worry. So Tirgum Zeri says, no, that's Ben Hagitot Shari. Only when you're in the wine press. Okay, there's some different opinions about why. Some people say because when you're in the wine press, before it ferments, people will actually drink it with the dregs, right? The dregs only become disgusting after the fermenting process. Nobody wants to drink them. But if you drink, have some dregs of grapes when they're fresh, it's really not a problem. What does this mean? It means you have to put it flat. You can't put like indented sort of for it to be pressed down. When you pour the wine in, it will do it by itself. But you can't actually do that on your own because that's more like you're preparing something. In this basket, you have to make sure. What happens? You put this basket and you want to strain it. So obviously there's something underneath it. There can't be a tefach of space between the kli, the utensil that's underneath it, catching the wine, and the basket. Why? Some people say because that creates a tent then. Then you're making it an OLRI. Once there's a tefach, there's already space, then it's like a tent. Other people say it's because you have to do it with some sort of shinoi, some sort of change from the way it's typically done. Amarav, hai prunka, apalge de kuba share, akula kuba asr. If you want to put a cover on a barrel, you want to stretch out this piece of material on as a cover, you can only cover it part way and not the whole way. Some people say we're talking about something that has, it's not clear exactly what it is. Some people say it has holes in it and we're worried if you stretch it the whole way, people will think that you're making some sort of strainer, which would be a problem. I'm a Rapapa. Last thing for today, you have to remember that Rapapa, they brewed beer in their family and here you're going to see it. So first he says, don't put something, um, don't put your, right, this is, I forgot what this is, Tsiniata, one second, it says, um, oh right, you can't put a bundle of straw underneath the spout because it's going to look like it's a strainer. Because it looks like you're, even though it doesn't really strain, it has this appearance like a strainer. And then he says, Debera Papa in his house, Shafu Shikhra Mimana Lamana, they would pour beer from one kli to another. Right? If you want to get rid of the dregs, what do you do? You start pouring from one to another. And in that way, you end up with clean beer. But when you get to the bottom, you're ending up really separating. As if you do it like that, it's not really separating. But when you get to the bottom, then you're really separating the dregs from there. So what do they answer? Obviously, they were beer makers. They didn't care about every little bit of beer. And they obviously just dumped. When you got close to the end, they just dumped it in the garbage. And that's why it was allowed for them to do this. Okay, we'll stop here for today. We'll pick up with the misnanet and the egg in the, in the mustard strainer tomorrow. Have a good day.